Hello and welcome back to this dingy little kitchen. Fred and I are here today to answer some of your deepest burning questions for the Budgie Eats series. You ready, Fred? Wake up! Camera's on. A couple of days ago, Julia put out a community post asking y'all what your deepest burning questions for Budget Eats are, and we're gonna answer two dozen of them today. If there are any questions that we don't get to today, feel free to ask them again in the comments below, and we'll address it on the next Budget Eats. And yes, there will be a next Budget Eats coming to you soonish. Be patient, my children. The first question comes from Murino8. Where have you been, June? Cry emoji. And Paige basically answers that first question. How are you doing since your mom's passing? I hope you have been able to take time to grieve and give yourself extra love. Heart emoji. Yes, my mom passed away early October. I have been busy cleaning out her house, sorting her affairs, and just trying to get through the days. So I've taken some time off of work and here I am, back. Changed, but kinda not. Life. If you've watched Budget Eats before, you'll likely have heard Mom's voice. She appeared in the first ever episode with Aaron Taste Testing, as well as the Christmas special, so thanks, Mom, for all of your help. We're so cute together. TM asks, how is Fred doing? Freddie, how are you doing? The people want to know. Blink ones for good. What are you doing up there, Fred? Fred, your tail's in the sink, you dummy. <laughs> Fred, you're a star. People care about you. We're still trying to get over the language barrier some days. Fred is a sweetie. He loves to eat his mush right after he gets flovented because he has asthma. Poor thing. For the most part, he's an angel and everything I could have ever asked for in a cat. Next question. The concept for this brilliant series, who was the mastermind behind it? Was it you, Fred? The Budget Eats idea was actually pitched well before the pandemic. It wasn't really approved because it wasn't seen as on brand for Delish, but my friend Devin watched a lot of food media videos like Bon Appetit, and he said to me, you know, we see all these recipes calling for 12 ingredients. You end up using a fraction of each of them. What do you do with the rest of them? So what if you made a show where we saw you buy your grocery haul and we see you through making every last bit of it into a dish? And I thought, that sounds fun. So when the pandemic hit and we were all stuck at home, self-producing videos, shooting ourselves, cooking and whatnot, Julia said to me, do you want to pick this idea up again? I remember you wanting to do it. And I said, why not? Let's do it. So we did it. And here we are. Happy Shiler asks, where do you shop June? I need to know the exact address for it. I feel like this is one of the highest asked questions on Budget Eats. People want to know exactly where I shop. And my question for you is, do you live in Queens near Jackson Heights? Because if you don't, I don't know if it's worth your time driving all the way here and saving I don't know, 10 bucks off your groceries, but you know what? You asked, I'll tell ya. The one that I frequent the most often is right off of the 61st Street stop, Woodside, on the 7 train in Queens. It is called Dollar and Up Fruit. It has a delightful selection of awesome produce, but also cheap produce as well. You go every day and they have rotating sales, they have dollar bags, and this is also where I get my dollar bone broth bones. And then about two and a half blocks down from Dollar and Up is Food Express Supermarket. It's a pretty standard, generic Chinese supermarket. And what I go there for is their Dollar Salmon Scrap bags. They also have a delightful snack selection. If you're into Chinese snacks, this is the place to go. And the third and final place that I go to for great deals actually has multiple locations. The store is called Mango Rico, and they have one all along Jackson Heights, some on the other side of Roosevelt, some on one side of Roosevelt. If you know, you know. And two of them are available on Google Maps. The third one is not. You'll just have to walk and see. You know, find treasures for yourself. I can't tell you everything. They often have... The 
beauty of living in Queens. They often have great produce selection as well. I find a lot of greens on sale there, a lot of fruit, and just really random, really cheap stuff. I don't know where this stuff comes from. It's probably not local, but if you're on a budget and you're in Jackson Heights, Mango Rico is your gal. Other stores that I like to frequent in Jackson Heights include Apnar Bazaar and Patel Brothers. Both of those are great for Indian ingredients, general South Asian ingredients, and they have spices upon spices, pulses upon pulses. I love the date selection. I also love to buy nuts there. Now, before inflation disaster happened, you could get three pounds of almonds at Patel Brothers for 10 bucks. Unfortunately, I went today and they increased the price as with everything else, so your mileage may vary. I often find a lot of new things at these stores and I always just like to treat myself to one strange to me thing so that I can become familiar with all the delicious things available to me in my area, which are many. Jordan Wrigley says, do you ever shop at any chain grocery stores? Would love to see a budget eats for a more common chain. The answer, Jordan, is yes. I do a lot of shopping for my other jobs at Delish, developing recipes. I don't always go to these local stores, which don't take Amex, by the way, for some weird reason. So I often go to local chains like Key Food. There's also Sea Town. I go to Stop and Shop too. I don't have Costco, which a lot of viewers have asked me to go to Costco or Walmart, maybe one day. Somebody drive me out to Costco or Walmart. There are, however, no Walmarts in New York City, so if we go to Walmart, you're gonna have to drive me far, far away from here, which I won't say no to. I'm ready for a road trip. Who's in? Ready? You wanna go to Walmart? Are you a Walmart cat? If you have any stores in mind that you would love for me to go and shop at, drop it down below, request it, thumbs up the people who have your same suggestion, and maybe we'll ask Julia to drive me there one day. Seek and ye shall find. Next question. If your cupboards were empty, what are the first five things you would buy to restock it? As you can see, I keep a lot in my cupboard, so this is a very loaded question. So the first type of thing that would definitely have to go into my cupboard is legumes. Things like lentils, beans, I want all of it. Peanuts are technically also a legume, so peanut butter would fall into this category too. The second category is tea. I really like to drink tea almost every day. I have a variety of them on hand at all times, so as far as beverages go, tea is my choice. I drink green, I drink black, I drink toasted grains. Those are really nice for both winter time and for summertime, chilled, delicious. So warming. The third category is gonna be snacks, and more specifically, corn-based snacks. Now, I can either have popcorn in my cupboards, or I can have pre-made corn snacks. Things like cheese crunchies I love, puffed corn nuts I love. There's just something so satisfying about that sweet earthiness of corn snacks. Fun fact about the way I like to use my popcorn, I like to throw them on a sheet tray into a 300 degree oven and just let them toast for about 10 minutes. This kind of develops a sort of caramelized flavor in them, just slightly nuttier, and it also sucks a little bit of moisture out of them so that when you go to pop it, they don't pop quite as fluffy. They pop into those little semi-popped forms of popcorn that you love at the end of the bag, you know, those that kind of feel like they might break your tooth at any moment, but Hashtag worth it. I especially love popcorn because there's just something so satisfying about waiting, anticipating for that pop, and then it happens all at once. And then you throw oil or butter or seasoning on it, and it's just, you make it yours. Another item that I can't live without is oil. I usually cook with olive oil, so if my cupboards were empty, gotta get a good bottle of olive oil. Otherwise, what are we eating? The next category of items would have to be a shelf stable sauce or condiment of some sort. I really like Japanese curry cubes. I also really like different types of Malaysian Thai curries. They come in a can sometimes. And if you can't access these Asian specialties, I really like to just keep on hand a jar of marinara, some tomato sauce, crushed tomatoes, diced tomatoes, tomato paste. They all work really well to infuse some umami into food. I've also been craving ketchup recently. I don't know why, but that tomato sweet, salty flavor is just so easy to make food taste great with. 
I like to keep some of these on hand because when the lazy days come and they do and in batches for very long periods of time nowadays, I can just dump some of this into a pot with some of my lentils or beans, let it cook, and then I have a meal. Pretty healthy, pretty filling, pretty comforting, and just very good for me overall. And if I'm allowed a bonus ingredient, it would have to be nuts and seeds. And I am so glad you didn't ask me about my fridge storage because there are too many things in there. Well, let's be honest, there's too many things everywhere in this kitchen. Karen Garner asks, which spice spices do you purchase or run out of most frequently? I cook a lot, but spices don't really run out like that. There's very rarely an instance in which I purchase the same spice twice in a single year. Having said that, I think my top two favorite spices to use, coriander and cumin. Whenever possible, I really like to buy the whole spice, toast it myself, grind it myself for that fresh, fresh, toasty taste. However, my spice grinder broke at the beginning of this year, so it is totally fine to buy ground spices. Just know that they won't taste quite as pungent or fresh. If you've seen the spice show, you'd know that spices don't really go bad or expire. They just kind of lose flavor and colorfulness. One way to revive older spices, if you still want to use them, is to toast them in oil. That helps them bloom their flavors a little bit more and develop slightly more fragrance. I don't know if you would call these spices, but I'm also a fiend for furikake. It's a Japanese mix that usually gets topped on rice or whatever you want, really. And Aaron brought me so many from his trip in Tokyo a while back. I'm still working through them. As you can see, I have this very bad habit of not finishing things so that I could just hold on to them for one day more. But absolutely delicious. If you've never tried furikake, highly recommend. When it comes to working in food media and styling food, I would say that the good old classic crushed red chili pepper flakes are an essential to have. Really versatile, really poppy, really flavorful, and it's just all around a winner. D asks, is there a recipe or ingredient that you think is worth splurging on? I mean, I think all ingredients are worth splurging on. It's just a matter of fact of can you afford it? Obviously, when it comes to animal products, the more expensive and local it is, the better it's gonna be, both for you, the environment, and the people who grow them. For me, given the palate and the preferences that I have when it comes to food, there's not really a luxury ingredient that I like to splurge on. It's more of the idea of supporting your community that grow the food. So when I have the money to splurge, I would love to just go to farmer's markets. I would love to pick out apples and buy whatever produce looks good that day. And if you can't afford that lifestyle and you just want to treat yourself to something, then I think anything that you want that is calling your name is worth splurging on. I think food is all about treating yourself and only you can decide what is worth splurging. Next question from Shadow Ruin. What a name, sir. As a college student on a budget trying to eat healthy, it's expensive and I don't like leftovers because of textures and or taste changes. Any tips when it comes to that? I think about three years working in restaurants, I realized that there's a lot of textural preferences when it comes to people enjoying food. Coming from a Chinese background, there are a lot of textures that I grew up with that the normal white American might not be able to tolerate or enjoy. It's just a matter of what you like and what you don't like, as with all things. So my question to you, Shadow Rune, is what textures don't you like? When I'm thinking leftovers, I'm thinking kind of gummified, overcooked pasta, or like really mushy, maybe slightly slimy pasta salads, potato salads, soups. If you don't like those textures, learn to like them or don't cook so much. But obviously there is a way to rework leftovers to change their textures. So if it's a soup, I, I don't really know if there's much I can do about soups, but you could put rice into the soup and cook something else in it and you could basically make it less loose and more chunky, filled with more substance. If it's a vegetable stir fry, you can make it into fried rice. You could potentially even, hmm, add a curry cube, turn it into a curry. If you have things like food processors or blenders, obviously you can just mash everything together and fry them into patties, pancakes, little croquettes. I feel like you've seen me do very dubious things to ingredients on Budget Eat, so 
just take some notes and apply the silly things that I do to your own band of ingredients and maybe you'll come up with a fantastic leftover rendition that you're gonna want to share in the comments down below. Step one to succeeding in life is believing in your own power to make ridiculous things happen. Just Carly asks, June, when reusing jars, do you have any advice for getting out strong odors like pickle, vinegar, garlic, pasta sauces, etc.? I love reusing jars, but some lids are just too smelly. Been there, done that. To be honest with you, I go through so many glass jars that I really don't keep the ones that get too smelly or too grody because otherwise they will just come crashing out of my pantry and Aaron will get very mad at me. However, if there is a jar that you love, a door to pieces, there are always things you can do to save it. Two things. The first one, you can take the lid from another jar that you don't want to save and it could potentially match another jar. Sometimes it can be a pain to get the labels off and I just give up and don't want to keep that freaking jar anymore, but I will save the lid just in case this lid fits another jar that I do want to keep. The second thing you can do is to boil it. Just put them in a boiling pot of water, maybe add some white vinegar as you see fit, and just let them sit in that sanitizing solution. 10 minutes, turn the heat off, let it sit until that water cools down in the pot, dump out the water, smell it. If that doesn't help you, I think it's time to let that lid go. But also, if you're extremely lazy like I am sometimes, if the lid smells, I just use it anyway. Sometimes the smells don't really transfer to the food inside the jar. So again, your mileage may vary. Just make your own choices. Jessica S. wonders, what herb or veggie would you recommend to grow in an apartment? What's needed? Well, as you know, I don't have the most amount of space in my apartment. This kitchen is pretty sizable for an apartment this big, so I'm lucky in that respect. You need sunlight, you need soil, you need pots. I sometimes just use yogurt containers. Takeout containers work too. The only real pot planter that I have is from mom's. And currently all I'm growing is just cat grass for Fred. They grow really fast, which is a great thing because as you can see, he destroys them really fast too. The only other thing I have planted in soil right now is these knobs of ginger. Grandma wanted to plant them when we were at mom's house and they just started growing shoots. I've never planted ginger before, so I, I have no idea what's happening here. If you know, drop me a comment down below. Can you actually pot ginger? I trust grandma. On previous editions of Budget Eats, you've probably seen me use windowsill herbs like basil, garlic chives, and repotted scallions. Those are all really easy to grow in an apartment. Basil is really hard to kill sometimes, but this year, inexplicably, they just all kind of died. So life and death, it happens. James Lynn says, I would love to know what your favorite meal from Budget Eats is. Are there any combos that really surprised you when you tried them? Yes. Let's go through our archives, shall we? I think from the first episode that I did with Aaron, judging is sweet and sour tamarind fried pork. That thing was in the pan for way too long while I was trying to get the doses just right and somehow that flavor of caramelization on the porky bits and the oniony bits and the sour tamarind sauce that was definitely expired when I put it in there and just I cannot believe that dish came out uh, and it was more than edible. It was delightful. From the $20 episode, I really love the sweet potato hummus wrap that had the um, homemade durum wheat tortillas. There were three kinds of garlic in that wrap and there's something about that kind of half crunchy, half soggy sweet potato fry with that sweet tortilla and the kind of savory, earthy hummus creaminess. Texture, flavor, color. I mean, it looked like beige on beige, but loved it. But I think if I had to choose just one meal, it's out of that $15 budget video. It's the eggplant veggie sliders with the baked fries and the cheese crisps. There is something about that mini burger slider feeling that makes it so cute and presentable and it was 
delightfully purple from the eggplant, red from the beet patty, green from the guacamole schmear, and it's just a feast for the eyes and the mouth and the soul. Lene wonders, do you ever remake any of the recipes you cook from the Budget Eat series? The answer is no, never. Do you? I think what makes Budget Eat so appealing to people is the spectacle of it all. I do a grocery haul, I don't get any do-overs. If I make a mistake, we gotta roll with it. The whole premise of Budget Eats is using every single thing that I got to the end for the entire week. Very rarely would I ever replicate a Budget Eats recipe because I simply just don't have that particular set of stuff on hand to make it. That being said, there's a reason why there's no Budget Eats cookbook. It's because the whole idea of Budget Eats is you do you with what you have. Here are the ways in which you can fuck food up in the best ways possible. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, and you just roll it with it. Just have fun or cry, either way. You gotta eat. Andre wonders, what was the most challenging diet to adapt to, vegan, low carb, or gluten free? Without a doubt, low carb was rough. I just remember that week of low carb, as we hit day two, I thought to myself, I'm not sure if I'm gonna make this. And I think on some nights I cracked, like uh, when the cameras were off, I had to eat an apple, I had to eat some cereal, I made myself some oatmeal because it's just like, my body does not know what to do when I don't have carbs. <laughs> On the flip side though, when we did the food pantry fresh produce box episode, there were so many processed carbs in that one that I also thought, wow, this feels real bad. So you really gotta find a balance. You gotta have your carbs, you gotta have your fats, you gotta have your proteins, you gotta have your veggies and fruits if you can, because otherwise, yes, you will feel shitty and it's not your fault. It's because you don't have access to the right foods that work for your body. Having said that, that hasn't stopped me from eating a straight cookie diet for the last two weeks. Like I said, life, it happens. Sharima asks, have you ever gotten sick due to some of the foods that you have tried? Have I? Do you remember me getting sick from any food I've eaten? No, never. Just yesterday, I tried a slice of this duck bacon raw because I wanted to. And Aaron was like, RIP, good luck. But I'm still here, alive and kicking. My stomach, titanium. But really when it comes to expired foods, you just have to pay attention to it. Look at it, does it look good? Smell it, does it smell off? Taste a teensy bit of it, be ready to spit it out. And does it taste fine? If it tastes fine, looks fine, and smells fine, Chances are, probably fine. However, do not sue me, you do you. Just know that a lot of the times these sell by best buy dates are often put there so that companies aren't liable for when customers do indeed encounter a bad product and also capitalism. Why not throw shit out and produce new ones when uh, you can? Snack break. Who knew vodka whipped cream tastes so good with peanut butter? Amanda says, what were you planning on doing with that chicken skin that ended up going bad before you could use it? I see you have watched all the episodes, Amanda. Let it be known that today was the day my dreams were dashed. See this? This is the chicken skin that I have been saving that I had great grand plans for. Well, it smells rotten. I remember as soon as I bought that chicken, I was staring at the skin and I was like, I'm gonna make something with you. And I was thinking of Inari. Inari is this kind of sushi that has tofu skin with rice inside. And I was thinking of using that chicken skin, stuffing rice and other stuff inside and searing it until that skin kind of shrinks around the filling. Basically a very non-vegetarian Inari sushi, uh, but not sushi and not inari, just chicken skin with stuff inside, seared until crispy and juicy. Shannon wonders, what fancy food would you make if you weren't on a budget? I don't like fancy food. 
I would say the stuff that I make on Budget Eats is pretty true to the type of stuff that I buy for myself anyways when it comes to groceries. So I don't really splurge on much except for maybe cheese, nuts, farmer's market apples. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've tried caviar, I've tried saffron, I've tried foie gras, oysters, truffles, just none of it really speaks to me. I do oftentimes wonder if these things weren't seen as a sign of prestige and class, how many people would genuinely like the taste of them? I would be happy with just local apples all day long. I'm personally against the idea of like, fancy ingredients and gourmet meals because really all they're saying is not a lot of people can have access to this. They're either very rare to begin with or labor intensive to produce or extremely, extremely expensive. I feel like sometimes when you slap fancy or gourmet on something, it just means I'm expensive, you can't afford me, therefore you suck. Which, you know, then just leads me to ask, why are you so expensive and unaffordable to begin with? And, um, are you actually that good tasting? Luck of Three asks, what type of cuisine do you find the most inspirational? I personally really enjoy watching street food vendors work. Anyone who's really finessed their craft over the entire spectrum of their lifetimes, that impresses me. When I see people cook, who just feel like the food and the process of making that food is a part of them, that's inspirational to me. When someone has done something so many times that their hands just know what the next move is, mind-blowing. Joe wonders, have there been any foods that you hated as a kid that you tried again in adulthood recently and realize your palate changed and you enjoy them now? Are there any foods that were your favorite as a kid that you despise as an adult? Olives and nuts for the first one. Believe it or not, my mom had to force feed me nuts as a kid because she believed that they were healthy and delicious and I was like, no mom, ew, these are disgusting. But now I am a nut addict. Olives, I remember when I first tried, so briny, so weirdly textured and I did not understand why anybody would eat them but now I understand I enjoy them I don't love them but I can eat them <laughs> progress I will also say that I recently developed a taste for salt and vinegar chips which when I first came to America and tried them I was horrified that these existed it felt like torture but now I like them. See, we're all capable of change. I remember being a very picky eater when I was a kid, so there's not really anything that I've not liked because there were so few things that I liked to begin with. The one constant food that I despise as a kid that I still despise as an adult is bitter melon. Mom has tried to force feed me bitter melon so many times, I've never grown an appetite for it. What foods make you the happiest to make and most comforted? Peanut butter aside, which I don't really make other than just twisting open the jar and putting a spoon in it, I love anything that has a mush consistency. So lentils, beans, anything involving any of those things, I love them. I also love to put bay leaves in my oatmeal when I cook up a pot of oatmeal. So again, anything that tastes like baby food. That is my thing. Annie asks, what other things or hobbies do you like to do besides cooking? Does eating count? Uh, pretty boring person here. I don't really like to do much besides maybe watching movies, listening to music. I like to take some photos sometimes. And now that we make videos, I like to make videos too. That's about it. I would say I love Fred, I love food, and I love photos. Kind of alliterative, right? Bethany says, I want to know what inspired her to become a chef. Y'all, I'm gonna blame Julia for this, but I am not a chef. Because of the need to fulfill SEO requirements when we put up these videos and title them, I'm often referred to as a chef. People come to expect me to be a chef, but I am not a chef. For me, chef comes from the French word for chief and to work in a kitchen, to be the head of the household or the kitchen household, you are the chef. 
I am a chef of no one except my own disasters. I don't really manage people, I just manage my own expectations and I even fail at that most times. And despite what you see on video, a lot of the times I have literally no idea what I'm doing. A lot of Budget Eats is experimental and that's why it makes me so excited to make them sometimes because I'm basically just playing with the ingredients that you see me buy. Am I making something edible? Sometimes. Have there been times when I've made things that I don't want to eat? Definitely. So if you're watching this video, just know that I prefer to be referred to as a cook, not a chef. And what inspired me to work in food? I love eating. That's it. And finally, for our last question, Caddy asks, do you know when the new Budget Eats is coming out? Caddy, I don't know exactly when the new Budget Eats is coming out, but just know it's on its way. Thank you for tuning in. Have any more questions? Drop them down below, and I'll see you next time.